Good evening and welcome to Driver's Ed tonight, um, the last class for this week. So please sign in. Good evening, good evening. Tonight we'll be talking about winter weather. Seems kind of strange since the temperature was 88 outside today. But uh, it's always good to talk about what you're going to eventually drive in in the wintertime. I always find people taking driver's ed during the summer to be at a slight disadvantage because a lot of you haven't done your practice driving with your parents, so really you got no experience with bad weather. Whereas if people turn 15, nine months in like August, September, um, they've got three or four months, then driver's ed, then driving in the winter, and uh, they're ready for it, so but you can't help what month or what day you were born. So here we are in June, nice weather, talking about sleet, snow, freezing rain. So it looks like it's a light class. I only see 10 people, 11 people. Uh, chapter 13, even though we're covering it tonight, I'm not going to really look over it until probably Monday because I think tonight's class uh, will not be um, completed. So this will give you a chance to finish up chapter 13 from the textbook. Also to remember to read section 3 in the manual. Uh, the state doesn't really do a lot when it comes to explaining situations. It's more like a two, three Senate paragraph, and then they move on to something else. So that's why we spend a little bit of time here in um, the online driver's ed class to discuss some of the topics uh, that they want you to be familiar with. So tonight we are dealing with driving in bad weather. So I'm going to get out of the music. And it looks like slowly. Now, I hope that everybody is done with their high school classes. I knew that this week was projects and things like that, but I'm, I'm hoping that everybody is done. That way you'll have to give me your full attention at 8 o'clock and do top-notch quality work for your homework. So you can't tell me that you had other things going on. So I'm going to just take a peek here, see who is who is here and who is not at the beginning. So hopefully everybody is on YouTube and have signed in on their phone or on YouTube. Basically, your phone is more important because I keep track of things that way. So, okay, let's get right into tonight. Hazardous driving conditions. So here we have a picture from the Boston Globe back in, um, oh, probably 2015. And if you take a look at this picture, you basically have... I think I counted once like 12 vehicles and about six or seven tractor trailers. And of course that's going to really tie up and this is interstate 95. So anybody that's going to work, anybody going to school, anybody on this road in the winter time is not getting to where they want to go. This happens. It does happen. But what I want you to realize is that driving in bad weather, let me get back to where I'm at. I want you to write this down, so I want you to know this for your final. There are two things to think about when driving in bad weather, okay? One 
is that you have to control your following distance. Your following distance has to be greater than when it's nice out because you don't have traction. So you want better following distance and you want a slower speed. So if we take a look at that picture again, I will almost guarantee you, let me give you what I think happened. Everybody was probably going around 40, 45 miles per hour, but there was one or two people that were trying to go a little bit fast to push the situation. They started to lose control. Everybody has to deal with them because they're slipping and sliding. So you're not staying in your lane any longer. Now you're starting to bump into other vehicles. They try to avoid you. Now they hit somebody else and it just piles up. If every, there's a tipping point, that's what I want you to know is there's a tipping point with your following distance and your speed where you no longer have control. So think of over on this side, you're in control and over on, on this side, you don't have control. So you want to balance it out. You've got to know when you're going out of control or when you're in control and always stay back a little bit from, um, getting to that tipping point. So if the tipping point is, let's say 40, 45 miles per hour, drive 35. No one's going to hit anybody if everybody's going 35. But for some strange reason, a lot of people out on the roadway, they see that speed limit sign and they think it's for every single day of the year. And it's not. That was part of your midterm. One of the questions of the speed limit is what is the speed limit? And, and it's not the maximum that you can drive in ideal conditions. It's basically, it's when you, uh, and all, you know, in bad weather too, you know, you've got to make sure that you're, you've got control of that speed. So in winter driving, I want you to write this down. There are three types of winter driving, driving in ice, sleet, and snow. Okay, those are the three, ice, sleet, and snow, and number them. Ice is one, sleet is two, snow is three. Ice is the worst, sleet is next, and then snow, all right? So that's the level of severity from one to three. So let's talk about the worst. The worst would be driving in ice. So let's take a look at what... And this is black ice. Now, black ice, by definition, takes on the resemblance of the pavement. That's where you get the word black ice. So here's a situation, I believe, in California. An expressway slick with ice, black ice, thin, nearly invisible to drivers. The ice has caused a car to crash in the fast lane. Trooper Jeff Oaken parks his cruiser to prevent a pileup. But behind him, drivers are approaching way too fast. Okay, take a look at the uh, picture right now. I kind of froze the, the video and I went back a little bit. The white vehicle is the police cruiser. If you take a look at the car that's coming up behind him, what did we say? Following distance and speed. So from where he is to where the cruiser is, he has two vehicles that are to the right of him. He basically has no place to go right now to the right. He can't go to the left because he's got the guardrail. So now he is forced to try to stop from where he is right now to the back end of that cruiser. So basically we know that he is running out of distance to stop. And because of black ice, he is just going to just ram that police car. If he was going slower... If he would have looked way up the road and said, oh, there's a police car in my lane, he could have looked to the right and maybe made a lane change to avoid what was going to happen. But what happens if we don't pay attention, we don't look further enough down the road, and then all of a sudden we find out we don't have the traction that we think that we're going to have. Let me show you a compilation of some bad weather in the winter. These are all cars that are going to lose control because they're going too fast 
and they don't know how to handle winter weather. And some of these situations are pretty bad. I'll show you the compilation here. So you, you get the idea. You can see that there are people that have no concept of the speed that they should be traveling in bad weather. Um, this should not happen to you. So let's kind of, and I, I thought this sign was kind of funny, so I threw it in here. Drivers ignoring winter conditions may be subject to natural selection. That is so true. Because if you do not learn from what we are covering tonight, uh, in your reading and practice when you start driving in bad weather, then uh, winter will be a cruel teacher. It will teach you these lessons by having a car crash, and that gets to be pretty expensive. So learning this tonight, learning this with your reading and uh, putting it into practice when we do have snow come in November, December, will make you a better driver. I'll guarantee it. Guarantee it. Okay, so we talked about ice being the worst. So write this down. Ice is the worst type of winter weather. And it is a problem of traction and not of vision. So ice is frozen water. We know that uh, snow melts or rain will, let's say it rains tonight, tomorrow morning, if it was November, December, there's a good chance the rain that happens at night will be actually frozen in the morning because temperatures continue to drop midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, and we may wake up not realizing we have black ice uh, when we go to school. So in your notes, I want you to write down November, December, and February, March, those four months, the end of November into December, the end of February into March are the two time periods during the year where black ice is the worst is because we really haven't had many snowstorms in November, December, and February, March. It starts getting warmer, and the snow will melt during the day. Then it will freeze at night, and people will get up in the morning to go to work, go to school, and not realizing they're encountering black ice in the morning. And remember black ice, where is it found on the road? Uh, it's more on the w right side near the white line because wa water will filter to the sides because the roads are banked or 
Uh, they're crowned. So that's why we have so many potholes near the white lines, not towards the center of the road. Is because water drains, freezes, thaws, freezes, thaws, breaks up, and creates potholes. Not that you can't have potholes other places, but definitely on the right side of the road, it's going to be the worst. Now, here's the key. How fast should you be driving? Okay, a crawl, which means 10 to 15 miles per hour. And you should be driving um, off away from where the ice is. So in the center of your lane or slightly to the left. Um, with 10 or 15 miles per hour, the other thing I want you to remember, I'm going to make believe I'm driving a car. If I'm going 10 or 15 miles per hour and I lose control of my vehicle, we talked about skidding in the back end going around. If I was to lose control of my vehicle and hit another object, a car, a tree, a guardrail, if I'm going at that slow speed of 10 to 15 miles per hour, my airbag will not deploy. Airbags deploy at 15 miles per hour. So we're going to take our first question. I want you to repeat or put in the comments, at what speeds do airbags deploy? At What's the beginning speed? All right, so I'm going to see who is still with us because we're uh, down a little bit uh, in our numbers. Now, the next type of winter weather, and here's a good example of, of a thin layer of ice. Overnight, it was rainy, and it started to freeze on the metal speed limit sign. And then in the morning, as it started to get warmer, notice it's daylight, the metal started to uh, retain some of its heat, and the, the ice was just slipping down. So what you see below the sign is what's on the road right now. So that would be a good example of what black ice would look like on the road if you were to, you know, break it away. It's a very, very thin. It's not not thick at all. It's probably less than one thirty seconds of an inch. It's it's coat just a coating. Now the other thing I want you to write down, especially with with ice forming, is bridges will always freeze first. So you can see that the road looks wet. Okay, it looks like there is some moisture on the road. Because you have air cir circulation above and below the bridge, you're going to uh, see the um, bridges create a skidding uh, sensation. So make sure that uh, when you go over a bridge and you think it's black ice, just bring your speed down a little bit and increase your following distance. And this is Massachusetts near Worcester. So the second type of bad weather I want you to write down is sleet. Now, how does it differ from ice? Now, ice is water that's on the ground that freezes. Sleet is actually moisture. It uh, could be rain that actually starts to uh, crystallize and, and it comes from the sky. So it is slightly different than ice. And how it really will create a problem for you is that it's going to create a problem with your side windows. Your front defroster with sleet, the front defroster will keep your front windshield going and keeping the, the ice that's forming on the front off. And on the rear defroster, will keep it off the back. But the problem I want you to write down in your notes, driving in the winter with, with sleet, it's your side windows. Now, you do have a side defroster that's going to help you with your side mirrors, but it only goes back about 10, 12 inches. So right where you're looking, so right when you do a lane change and you do a shoulder check, that is still going to probably be frozen up on the windshield. So what I want you to realize is that when your visibility is blocked on the sides, you've got to go slower as you pull out and take longer in making that decision whether you're going to pull out into traffic. You don't want to make a mistake and, and have to like, take it back or want to go back in reverse because you're, you're not going to have enough time and you shouldn't. There could be someone behind you anyways. But a lot of times people will start to go forward and then they look and they go, oh no, here comes a car faster than I thought. And you're stopping right in the middle of the road. They're on a road that has sleet. They can't stop. And now they're hitting you. You're in their lane. You're at fault. Not a good situation. So kind of look both sides, kind of creep up a little bit, take a little bit longer making that decision whether you're going to pull out, and that will uh, help you out. The speed that you should drive uh, in sleet, 
I would say cut your speed limit in half. So if it's 30, go 15, 18, you know, a little bit above half. If it's 40, 20, if it's 55, you know, high 20s, low 30s. But let your car speak to you, meaning that if the car is starting to slip and slide, then it's time to back off on the accelerator. Now you're going too fast. So uh, just re realize that uh, it's better to estimate on the slow side than on the fast side. So snow comes in two different forms. Okay. So I w most of you probably don't think of, about this, but now that you're going to be a driver and this is just the way that I, I think the two types of snow is wet snow and dry snow. So I want somebody to put down in the comments, which one is worse. And I'll tell you in about five minutes. Now, snow is going to create a vision problem and a traction problem. So where should you drive on the roadway if it's snowing? Try to align your car in the tire wipes of the cars in front of you. So if you've got cars that are driving in front of you, line up your tires directly, even if it's right of center or left of center, just line your two tires because that is where other cars have gone. Their tires are going to be you know, pulling some of the snow and displacing it. So you're going to have more contact with the roadway, putting your vehicle in that situation. And think about this in all bad weather. A lot of times you're not going to see your lines. Lines are going to be gone. You're not going to even see them. So where do you put your car? Where the tire marks of the car in front of you is gone. Use the vehicle in front of you as a guide because if his tires have created a, a, a ridge and he's slipping and sliding, that should speak to you saying, I'm going to stay where he is, but I've got to go a little bit slower because he's having issues. So learn from the people that are in front of you. No one's going to guess about what's the worst type of snow. Oh, yes, M Mateo, you're the, you're the man. Wet snow. Now we get people coming in. Yes, wet snow is going to adhere to the, uh, the tread. And it's not going to spit out. So, um, Anthony, what's the problem here? Okay, Anthony, you're supposed to be watching tonight. All right. Um, I'll send something to you a little bit later indicating what your classes are. Okay. Because you probably have a sheet. Um, that's, that's a little bit, a little bit off because the numbers are different. Okay. So no, no problem. Okay. Um, extreme snow conditions. This is photoshopped. Okay. This looks terrible. Okay. This looks absolutely terrible. Um, but it's not real. This picture is real. Notice the, the tractor trailer. Look at the snow just to the left of the tractor trailer. It is just a little bit above where the cab is. That is a 10 foot, that's about 10 feet snow banking. This is real. So when you come to the end of this road, whether it be a traffic light or a stop sign, you're not going to see cars coming from the left or the right. That is going to be a major issue. That's going to be bad. So let's kind of go through some of the safety practices for driving in winter. One is go someplace like a back road or parking lot and get a feel for the road. So that means kind of lose control, regain control, spin your tires, try to go fast, then try to stop and see what happens. Does the car really lose control? What does ABS feel like when I'm braking? You want to experiment, and I don't mean go crazy in a parking lot where the police are going to come and tell you to stop goofing off, but I always think it's a good idea to to get a feel for a car that's losing control in a parking lot because you don't want to have that feeling for the first time when you're driving. Uh, be careful pulling away from stop signs, traffic lights. Don't spin your tires. Braking distance should be, always be at least two or three times no, your normal braking distances. Uh, you may not see your stop line, so always use stopping at the sign rather than trying to guess where the stop line is. 
keep your vehicle in good driving condition. So that means make sure that the defroster is blowing heated air. That means that you've got your antifreeze checked. You've got uh, uh, just a go over on your car. So getting all these things taken care of in November before the first snowfall will make you a better driver. Let's talk about warming the car up. There's a lot of debate on the internet. Some people say it's a waste of fuel. Some people say it's something that you should do. I am a firm believer that warming up your car for at least five to 10 minutes is advantageous for you as a driver. For one, it's gonna make you more comfortable. No one wants to be in a freezing cold car. Uh, your passengers don't want to be in a cold car either. So uh, warm it up. And the other thing is that anything that's liquid in your engine will not freeze up. And I, I've got a drink right now. So if I was to leave this uh, seltzer in the car and it was 30 degrees out in the morning, it would be solid, okay? But the oil, the gas, the power steering, the antifreeze, doesn't freeze up like you would a bottle of water. But it does, write this down, it does make it thicker. So a thicker liquid isn't going to move through the hoses like your brake lines. It's not going to move like it normally does. So when you go to use the brake pedal, it's not going to feel the same. So the colder the temperature, the longer you should warm up your vehicle and the more likelihood you're going to feel a difference. So be very careful jumping into a cold car and then driving away and thinking that you're gonna be able to accelerate and brake the same. It just isn't gonna happen. Uh, look for danger spots on the roadway so you're looking for your potholes, you're looking for black ice. Remember that um, the sun will penetrate through most trees except pine trees to warm up the pavement and eventually after a snowstorm you're going to get dry pavement but any places that have heavy um, trees especially pines the 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 sun isn't going to penetrate through and those areas will probably always be icy or bad in the winter time you're never going to have a real good time to drive on those spots so your back roads are going to probably be a little bit more dangerous than driving in durham and dover and places like that um, carbon monoxide poisoning, I, I didn't pull the article that I normally show um, or discuss, but carbon monoxide poisoning is that when your exhaust system is leaking into your car. So there's a hole in the, in the muffler or in the tailpipe or whatever. Some of that, uh, the gases are leaking into the driver's compartment. And what I want you to write down in your notes, because this was from the article. I don't think, let me see if I, if I have it next, if the bullet. No, that's just warming up your car. Okay, uh, write this down. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning can happen in as uh, quick as 15 to 20 minutes, which means that you're stuck in traffic because there's been a crash. While you're stopped in traffic and you're waiting to go again, crack the windows a little bit because your car is just sitting and running and that the, the exhaust is coming up inside the vehicle and you may not even know it. It's, it, it could put you, it could make you pass out in 15 minutes, 10 minutes um, if your car is uh, airtight and it's leaking up into it. Uh, it can be that bad. And I had an article that uh, a 10 year old boy in, in Boston he was in a vehicle and uh, he fell asleep because he was tired and his parents didn't know he was in there. And uh, he passed away within 15, 20 minutes. So let's take a look. Uh, driving in winter weather, I would highly recommend if you really want to get good at it and have a little bit of fun is take a winter driving school class. It's not like what you're doing right now with me. Uh, it's like a one day event. You do like an hour or two in a classroom like we're doing right now, talking about some things. And then they take you out to like a skid pad. And like a, how I told you to go out in a parking lot, you're, you're going to do that under the supervision of a trained um, instructor. And they're going to tell you how to make your car slip and slide and how to regain control. So this is what it basically, um, what, it, what it looks like. Um, 
I forgot to show you the thing on ice. Maybe I'll show that. Looking for a new car or truck? TheAutoChannel.com has the most complete and up-to-date pricing, vehicle specifications, and reviews. While driving on ice and snow can be a frightening experience if you're not mentally and physically prepared, there really are no deep, dark secrets to controlling your vehicle in difficult circumstances. The Bridgestone Winter Driving School features purpose-built tracks designed to duplicate the most challenging, real-world driving situations. It is critical to clear all snow and ice from your vehicle, including the roof. Snow left on your roof will quickly obscure the rear window, and when you begin to drive, large chunks of flying snow can block the vision of drivers beside or behind you. To steer smoothly and correctly, place your hands at the 9 and 3 o'clock position on the steering wheel. Keeping your hands on opposite sides of the steering wheel allows you to steer through a corner efficiently and precisely. Do not attempt to deflate your tire to gain a bigger contact patch with the road surface because this will only lessen the performance of your tire. Only a properly inflated tire offers maximum grip. Also, remember tire pressure can change according to the outside temperature. Tire pressures drop 1 PSI for every 10 degrees in temperature drop. Also, check your tire pressures regularly to ensure proper inflation. This is especially important in late fall or early winter as temperatures begin to drop. The number one rule of safe winter driving is to adjust your speed to the current conditions. These conditions include the type of tire, the road surface, visibility, the type and weight of your vehicle, and your driving ability. With the traction control and stability control systems in today's cars, many people become overconfident or simply complacent. These systems can help drivers by alerting them to improper responses or correcting small mistakes, but they can't overcome the laws of physics. If your car is equipped with standard brakes, the most effective way to stop in an emergency situation is to use the pumping technique. Most drivers are aware of this concept of pumping the brakes, but don't really understand the proper technique. Thanks for watching the Auto Channel. So that is what they do. And it, from what I hear, I haven't participated in it, but I, I hear it's a top-notch class. We have actually, I believe, two areas in New Hampshire, one way up north and one over um, just west and south of Concord that does it. So just right around the Concord area and then way up near Franconia Notch, I believe that they do it. So one of these days I'm going to do it. I'm usually on the road with you guys, so I don't have much free time. But people that I know that have taken it uh, speak highly of it. I forgot to show you uh, a clip on um, driving on ice. So I'm going to show you that right now, just so you can see the thin layer of it. There's also ice. Ice on a roadway isn't like ice in a glass of water. You don't necessarily see it. If it's a sunny day, you can have glare on the road and it just appears that the roadway is wet when actually there, there is ice on the road and it can catch you by surprise. If you have to drive on ice, slow down to a crawl. When it's freezing or near freezing, be extra careful on bridges, overpasses and streets shaded by trees or buildings. These areas tend to freeze before the rest of the roadway and they're the last to thaw out. If it's icy and you approach a curve, slow down before you get to the curve. If you suddenly slow down or speed up while turning, you will go into a skid. Like ice, snow can be deceptive too. Once it starts to pack down and then you have temperature changes where it melts some, freezes, melts some, freezes, then you end up with that icy condition again. And yes, you can see it, but it can still be very deceptive in terms of how slippery it will actually be. Again, it's essential to slow down. If you're driving in packed snow, cut your speed to half of what you'd normally drive. To increase traction, use snow tires or tire chains placed over the tire tread. Whether you're driving in snow or rain, the American Automobile Association gives seven tips for safer driving. One, prepare in advance. Clean your windows and lights. Check the tread and pressure of your tires. Check your windshield wipers, headlights, and other equipment to make sure they're in good working order. Two, be extra careful. Drive slower and allow extra space between your car and others. Three, drive in the tracks of the vehicle in front of you. Since those tracks are drier than the surrounding pavement, they provide better traction. Four, 
Give plenty of advance notice to other drivers. If you plan to turn or slow down, let other drivers know early enough so that they have time to react safely. Five, be alert. Watch for pedestrians trying to get out of the weather. Six, keep your low beam headlights on. This helps you to see better and helps others to see you. And seven, ease your way into turns or curves, avoiding any sudden starts and stops. A few tips for when you and bad weather meet out on the highway. I'm Ryan Wickram. So that is driving in ice and bad weather. Um, okay, let's talk about getting stuck in the snow because inevitably you're going to be driving, you're going to lose contact with the roadway, your car's going to go off the edge, and you're all by yourself and you can't get out. A um, couple things that I want you to write down. This is not in the manual right now. Uh, they took this out. I, I think it would, they did a disservice by doing that uh, because some bad things can really happen if you don't follow some of these rules. If you do not know where you're walking to, do not leave your vehicle. I'm going to get out of here for a second. People freeze to death or they get hit walking for help. If you're walking on a roadway in an in a active snowstorm, the snow could be adhering to your body and people aren't going to see you. And if they're slipping and sliding, they can't gain control of their vehicle. They're going to just mow you over. And if you are going to be walking, you've got to be facing traffic so you see that they're slipping and sliding. Um, but I wouldn't. I'd stay. I would stay with the vehicle. Uh, the other thing about being in the car in the winter time. I'm going to get my phone out. So write this down. Always have your phone fully charged or have a cable that you can charge your phone inside your car. You never want to have a dead phone when you're driving. The other thing is that phones now have GPS. So if anything ever happens, you should have that activated where your parents should be able to find you. So here are my three rules for a young person when you are driving in the winter at night. First of all, tell your parents where you are. Okay, let me give you an example. Dad, I'm going to go to the movies with my three friends. So they know where you are. Second thing, tell them when the movie's out and how you're going to get home. Meaning, which route are you going to take? I'm taking Spalling Tur Turnpike. I'm taking Route 4. The reason why I want you to write this down is because if anything ever happens to you, or if your phone is dead, or it's not working, well, then you wouldn't have been making a call to your parents. Maybe your friends would have to call. Well, anyways, they know which road that you are on. Okay, there's going to be... And then basically, who's in the car with you? So if your parents get any calls, because you said you're with your friends... If the friend parents calls your dad, then he's going to say, oh, yeah, they just went to the movies. They're coming back. They're taking this route. It just saves a lot of headaches if anything is bad because the worst thing is not having communication. Remember the video that I showed you on the dangers of speed in hills, how the parents could hear sirens and they wanted to know what was happening, okay? This might have been avoided, you know, telling parents, what road that you're on, who's in the car. It, it, it just makes things so much easier. Red is, as we said last night, means that the car is disabled. It has no electrical power. So put a red flag on your vehicle indicating that it has no, um, no power. Let me kind of go back to uh, what to do if, if people are going to help you. I, I was going to talk about this last night, but I knew that we were going to discuss this tonight. Let's say that you have car problems in the winter time, or really any time. It could have been last night's class too. So write this down. Have your phone ready while you're waiting in your car. If anybody comes to your vehicle, you see in your rearview mirror that somebody is coming to your car, okay? Hold up your phone, take a picture. Because the camera can go both ways, take a picture of the car that stopped to help you. Because now you're gonna have a record of the color of the car, the license plate. The other thing, and I'm just going to put my phone off to the side right here. 
put your phone on record, whether it be a video or whether it just to be a, a recording. If someone comes to the window and talks to you, you want to have that recorded or a picture of the person that is helping you in case anything goes wrong. Okay. Anything that's recorded to my phone goes to the iCloud. So even if someone was to see the phone and grab the phone, steal it, break it or whatever, it's already up in the cloud. Okay. He can't, they can't stop that from, from happening. So these are just safety precautions if you feel uncomfortable with coming. And by the way, just crack the window a little bit. Never roll the window down so someone could grab you. Okay. So just crack it down a little bit. Say, no, I've called my mom, my dad, someone, AAA, they're coming. But if you roll down the window too much, they could grab in, get inside the car. Just a lot of bad things. And, and this is all from um, experience of looking at incidents throughout the country where things have just gone wrong really, really fast. So it's not in the manual, not in the textbook, but hopefully it's something that you will remember. A couple more things. Uh, keep your passengers warm. This is why I carry extra blankets and coats in my trunk. I have a rain jack in case it's raining. Keep the engine running long enough to keep you warm. But remember, if your car is off the edge of the road where people can't see it because you just went over an embankment, um, you probably don't have enough fuel to last all night. So like right now, it's getting pretty dark. So let's say that uh, around 9, 930 in the middle of December, you went off the road about 30 feet and no one can see you and you think you broke your leg, you can't get out you probably don't have enough fuel for the whole night. So run the engine long enough to keep you warm, then turn it off. Turn it back on, get warm, turn it back off. So like every half hour, go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, be careful if people do go to sleep if the car is running because it could be, it could be carbon monoxide poisoning and we've already talked about uh, GPS. Now the next situation that is they consider hazardous driving is driving in fog. Now this person thinks that fog is as bad as winter driving. I do not. Fog is not a traction problem. It is a vision problem. If you take a look at this snapshot right now, we see two vehicles that are in front of us. But what you don't see, and I'm going to show the video in a minute, you don't see what's coming down the hill. There are two cars coming down the hill that don't have their headlights on. Okay, let me let me show you the um, the video. Fog is considered the most dangerous of all driving hazards. The best advice for driving in fog is don't. It's simply hard to see what's around you. If you must drive, then slow down and turn on your low beam headlights. The low beams help you to see and help others to see you. Driving instructor Zandrea Baldwin is on. The glare is going to come back toward you from the fog. The fog is pretty much like a light. And if your light is shining against the fog, it's going to glare back into your, to your um, windshield and it could actually cause temporary blindness. Because of the reduced visibility, it's vitally important to slow down and stay slowed down. Also, Use the right edge of the road as a guide rather than the center line. This can help you to avoid running into oncoming traffic or from becoming distracted by oncoming headlights. And don't be too proud to ask for help. Get your passengers involved. Have the passengers help you out, checking blind spots and things of that nature for you. If the fog gets really thick, signal and pull off the road to a protected area. Then wait for the fog to let up. While pulled over, turn on your emergency flashers to make your car more visible to others. A final note, whatever you do, don't stop in the middle of the roadway, no matter how thick the fog is, that almost guarantees that someone will hit you from behind. Again, it's best not to drive in the fog at all. If you have to, stay alert. I'm Katina McHenry. So driving in the fog, as long as you're staying to the right, white edge line. And remember, another name for that white line is called the fog line. When you go on your state uh, driving test, the people that test you call it the fog line. So don't be confused. That's what they're talking about. The fog line is not the yellow line. It's the white line. So just reduce your speed. Uh, don't follow too closely. And really driving the fog isn't that bad. The one thing I will tell you, I don't know if I've got it on the next slide here. Um, it is 
more prevalent in the early morning, late afternoon. So whenever there is a increase of temperature, so in the morning it's cold and it gets warmer, there's going to be fog, like from a 7 to about 8, 8.30. And then in the afternoon, probably in the fall, 4.30 to 6 o'clock. So whenever you have an increase of temperature, a decrease of temperature, and it's near a body of water, if you've ever been near a lake or an ocean in the morning, you can kind of see the, it looks like steam, it's actually fog coming off the body of water. So that's going to create a problem when you drive. Now, it doesn't usually just stay on the road. It, it, it kind of just kind of moves like a cloud. So if it gets really bad, just pull over the side of the road and probably within... 30 seconds to a minute or two, it's going to get uh, a little bit better. But don't drive if you can only see 30 feet, 40 feet in front of your car. Let me show you a, um, a picture of a highway in California. Look at that. Oh, the video is lagging. I apologize. Um, hopefully it will get better. So it could be just a drain. Um, this is a highway in California where there were over 200 or close to 200 cars that got piled up. And basically it's because they were following too closely and going too fast. So if you take a look at the article over on the right hand side, it says they could only see 50 feet. When you can only see 50 feet, you, you need 50 feet for stopping distance. And they were going so fast that they needed like 55, 60 feet. So there was five to 10 feet not accounted for. So um, know, know your speed, know it. We already saw the, the video on fog. Okay, let's talk about three situations that uh, probably will not happen in New Hampshire, but it will in other parts of the country. So I want you to write down high winds, sandstorm, and hail. So this was in the textbook, chapter 13. So if you did the reading, this should have been, it's lagging still. Hmm. Okay, we'll see if it's going to still lag. We won't, we've got uh, a couple of videos coming up. Let's see if the high winds, if, if, it, if it lags now. So basically what I want you to write down for high winds is don't drive next to tractor trailers. Now, when you're coming up behind a tractor trailer, it's very difficult to tell for sure whether they have a full load. Now, these trailer tractor trailers that are tipping over are empty, of course. If they had a full load, that wouldn't happen. But also notice when you're traveling wide open spaces and over bridges, extremely dangerous extremely dangerous. So my recommendation, if you don't have to drive, you probably should wait. You know, pull over to a rest area, 
get a bite to eat for an hour or so, and then get back out on the road. Uh, and if you are out on the road, just don't drive next to these large, large trucks. Now, in your notes, a sandstorm is going to be a lot like driving at night. Okay, so sandstorms like driving at night. You're going to put your headlights on so people see you and you want to go at a lower speed. Now, right now, this is the beginning of the video I'm going to show you. You can see the roadway, but as we go about a minute into this drive, notice how the conditions change dramatically, how dark that it actually gets. So let's see driving in sandstorm. So right now it's pretty clear. So normal driving, normal speed. His following distance is pretty good. But like I said, we're gonna go about a minute into this video. Now we're starting to see it's getting a little bit darker. Okay, he moved over a lane, so now his following distance is better than when it was behind the white vehicle. Notice the brake lights in front. Okay, traffic light, all of a sudden now you see it. Now once they go through the traffic lights here, it's gonna get much, much darker. But you can already see in like 30 seconds to a minute the, how, how, how dark it actually gets. So if you can't see, pull over. Don't, don't risk it. Don't risk it. And it's just going to get darker. Look at that. Notice that the camera can't even focus now. Autofocus on the camera. The other thing, too, is you got to remember that sand particles are in the air. So this is kicking up into the um, grill of your vehicle. And it's going to get into your uh, air filter. And you're going to run into some problems with how your car runs if you stay in this for too long. So I would say pull over. Like I said, with the high winds, it's going to probably pass. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you is, is driving in hail. So hail is usually in warm weather where the rain starts coming down, but it comes down so hard uh, that it's coming through the atmosphere so fast that on the way down, it's freezing and clumping together. Around here, I think I've only seen hail... Uh, about the size of a pea, you know, a vegetable pea, not very big. Um, but in the Midwest, and I'm going to show you a video here, it is big enough to be like a golf ball and it will actually break your windshield. Oh, and there's that beautiful wall cloud right in front of us. Um, that we're getting baseball size hail. Oh my gosh, bigger than baseball. Woo, -hoo, we're getting close to grapefruits over here. And I got it on camera. Oh my gosh, we've got softball size hail going on. And I just okay? got, yep, I'm okay. I just got glass all over me. We gotta get out of this. Yep, that just happened. How do you know we can get out of it? We don't no, just keep driving. That's all we can do. I have glass all over me. Don't move, don't move. I mean, if I'm gonna, oh my gosh. Yep, got that one too. Can we find a place to pull under? Oh my gosh, this is the biggest tail I've ever seen. Oh, and it's all, oh, I'm covered in glass. This, I, I, what do you want me to do? There's nothing you can do, man. Pull up beside that building. We've lost our windshield. Um, uh, this is five to six inch size hail. I mean, it's bigger than softballs and grapefruits. I've never seen it. So that was pretty big hail. So what I want you to write down, and he was talking about it in the video, look for a place to pull under. So look for an underpass of a bridge, look for a gas station that you could go underneath the pump, but you've got to remember everybody else on the road is going to be thinking the same thing. Now I'm going to just um, go back to the video just a little bit, even if it means going over to the other side of the 
that beautiful wall cloud right in front of us. So I'm going to play the video just a little bit. Oh my gosh. Bigger than And then I'm going to stop it. We're getting close to grapefruits over here. And I got it on camera. Oh my gosh. We've got softball size hail. Okay, up ahead on the left is a bigger side tree, a good sized tree. I would get up to that tree. I'd pull a Yui right here or even drive over on the left side onto the shoulder because there's no oncoming cars right now. I would look for shelter. That is the biggest tree that I can see in this picture. And notice his windshield is already broken. So you've got to look for something pretty quick. And you could just see by the sky that it's not going to last very long, only where that dark cloud is going to be, where it's going to happen. So just like with driving emergencies, you're going to be thinking very quickly of what to do. You're not going to have a lot of time to plan this stuff out. You're just going to have to react. Now, a type of weather that we're going to encounter every single day, for those um, of you that drive on a regular basis with your parents, we are supposed to get some rain in the next couple of days. Uh, if you've never driven in the rain, I would recommend doing it uh, tomorrow or Saturday when we get it. Uh, and put into practice some of the things that we're talking about right now. So the first thing I want you to write down, rain or hydroplaning doesn't usually happen unless you're going too fast and you have bad tires. Oh, good question. Um, Kata asked about uh, sandstorms will take off paint and the same thing with hail. And um, um, I'm going to put this uh, a reminder for me to talk about it on next Thursday. We're going to talk about insurance. So if you want to write this down right now, all these situations, high winds, hail, and sandstorm, if anything bad happens to your vehicle, most insurance policies will cover any type of damage to your vehicle. But that's a good question. A plus for asking good questions, people. A plus. Um, rain doesn't usually cause a traction problem. So write that down. Rain does not usually cause a, a traction problem. It's because of bad tires and fast speeds. It will create vision problems every single day. So this is why you've got to have a good defroster and good windshield wipers. Now, here's a question. I don't know if I still have it on the final. I know that I used to, so you can write this down. Why did I put down it's the most dangerous at the first half hour? In the summer months, when the pavement gets really hot, oil and fluids of your vehicle will drop onto the pavement, and they're usually very slippery. If you've ever had oil on your hand, you know how slippery it can be. So when the rain and the oil that's on the road mix together, when you're coming up to a stop sign, a traffic light, or coming into a parking spot, there's a good chance your car is going to hit one of those little patches and you're going to slip about two to three feet. It's going to push you forward. And usually, if you come up right behind somebody too closely, this is where you're going to rear end somebody. If you've ever uh, taken a look at a parking spot, and I should have put a picture in here. If you take a look at a parking spot, most parking spots are going to have little black circles about the size of volleyballs. That is where oil has dripped off underneath the car onto the pavement. So when you drive into these parking spots, if that's a fresh, if that's a fresh spot, then you're going to slip and maybe hit the car in front of you or hit the curb. That's why I say it's very dangerous, especially the first half hour. Wet leaves in the fall, they kind of pile up together. They can be just as uh, slippery as ice. Uh, headlights should always be on. Uh, you should know uh, that when you drive with me, I require you to have headlights on. Uh, they're, they're called day running lights. I'm requiring you to have them on all the time. It's not for us to see the road. It's for people to see us. So right now in the comments, since I see we're kind of down on views, I want people to write down day running lights. Day running lights is what you put on all the time when you drive. Now, the last thing, and you won't find this in the manual and you won't find this in the textbook, is what is the difference between a pothole and a puddle? 
So I'm going to bump out of here for a second. A pothole is very circular, okay? It's very circular, and it goes down abruptly, and then your tire is going to pop up over it. A puddle is kind of like all over the place. It's got a curvy edge to it. Um, it could be thinner and then get wider and then come back out again. But a pothole is going to be a very circular area and around the edges will be broken pieces of pavement. So if you see broken pieces of pavement around water, it means it's a pothole. Try to straddle it with both tires or to go around it. You're going to ruin your alignment. You could, like we talked about last night with driving emergencies, it could cause a flat tire. So try not to hit potholes. Not good for your vehicle, all right? So that's that's driving in rain. And hydroplaning usually begins around speeds of 35. I don't think I have it on this. I think it's on the next slide. Oh, this is why you have your um, day running lights on. Inside those red marks, right where the arrow is pointing is a car. Okay. okay, people are putting in there. Good job, Adam. Good job. So let's take a look at uh, driving, driving in the rain. The weather can present traffic hazards. Take rain. It's a hazard from the moment the first drops fall. This is when rain first mixes with oil and dust on the pavement. It's very slick. This is what happens. The dirt and oil float to the top of the water. So tires ride not only on the slippery surface of water, but also directly on the even more slippery surface of oil and dirt. It's no wonder so many crashes happen just after it starts raining. Eventually, dust and oil wash away, but plenty of hazards remain. Rain, especially heavy rain, limits your ability to see. It's hard for you to see what's going on, and it's hard for other people to see you. In addition to making it difficult to see, rain keeps roads slippery. Traction becomes a critical issue, and hydroplaning, a real danger. Three main factors cause a car or truck to hydroplane. Speed, tread depth, and water depth. The faster your car or truck goes, the more traction you lose on a wet surface. The more worn your tires are, and the shallower the tread, the more likely your car is to hydroplane. Even a thin layer of water can cause your car to lose traction. But as the water gets deeper, you lose traction sooner. It all happens in a space no bigger than the bottom of a size nine shoe. Now picture this, it's a smooth roadway. There's moderate rain and you're traveling at 60 miles per hour. Under these conditions, each tire has to move away about one gallon of water every second. All in a space no bigger than this shoe. Each gripping element of the tread is on the ground even less time, 1 50th of a second. During this fleeting moment, the gripping element must move the water from beneath the tire and then grip the road surface. If this doesn't happen, your car may likely hydroplane. When a car hydroplanes, the most important thing that someone needs to remember is don't panic. First, do not brake or accelerate suddenly. Since hydroplaning is a loss of traction to the front tires, sudden braking on a front or rear wheel drive slows the front tires but locks the rear tires. This can cause a spin out. Also, sudden acceleration on a front or rear wheel drive may take the vehicle straight ahead. This could be dangerous if the vehicle is pointed toward the edge of the roadway. According to some driving experts, what you should do depends on the type of vehicle you're in. Listen for the type of vehicle you drive. A front wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. Front wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. A rear wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. If you begin to hydroplane in one of these types of cars, then some driving experts suggest you do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. Stay lightly on the accelerator and steer gently toward the open space which you have identified. If you are in a rear wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system, then do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. 
ease off the accelerator and steer towards the open space which you have identified. Traction control systems, by the way, have been installed in vehicles for a number of years now, but everyone may not be familiar with. This is a system that prevents tires from spinning under acceleration. If your vehicle has a traction control system, there should be an icon indicating so on your dashboard. Another note, it's important not to have the cruise control engaged in heavy rain due to a sudden acceleration problem. The vehicle will recognize the water buildup as a slowdown and ask for more power. This need for more power may shift, causing the vehicle to shift to a lower gear and build more water under the tires. This causes a cycle of more power and more push on the front tires. You can avoid hydroplaning by making sure the tread on your tires is thick enough and by slowing down. Here's a good rule of thumb for checking your tread. Stick a penny upside down in your tread. If Lincoln's head is hidden, then your tread is thick enough. If the tread doesn't hide Lincoln's head, then your tread is too thin and you need new tires. When it comes to speed on a wet road, slow down by about one third of what you would normally drive. For example, if you normally drive 60 miles per hour on a dry highway, slow down to 40 when it's wet. So driving in the rain isn't really that complicated. Um, do write down in your notes that it will be more challenging at night. So if you're going to get some nighttime driving in, I would recommend that you do it um, when it's nice out. I wouldn't do driving at night in the rain uh, if you've got less than like, you know, 15 hours in. Because uh, you got really two double negatives. You've got the rain to deal with, and then you've got the darkness to uh, drive with. So it, it may be a little bit much. Um, if you do try to do it like on roads of 30, 35, stay away from your back roads and stay away from the highways because you've got to think a lot quicker on the highway and on back roads, you, you're just not going to have lines and things to help you. So 30, 35 and through town, it's not the worst thing. So what is hydroplaning? Hydroplaning is when your tires do go up on the water. It really just lifts up your tire probably about a quarter of an inch. And a lot of people say, well, how much water has to be on the pavement for my car to hydroplane? Anything that is deeper than your tread. So whatever you have for tread depth, if it's above that, there's a chance you could hydroplane. But as I spoke to you early in class tonight, Hydroplaning does not usually happen on a car that has decent tires and you're going the speed limit. It's going to probably happen on back roads where the roadway wasn't um, engineered correctly and you're going to have puddling of water. And if you're driving too fast and your tires are worn, it's just a recipe for disaster and you'll probably hydroplane. So if you're going 35 or over on a back road, yeah. It could happen, but the likelihood, probably not. So make sure you understand this, okay? Write this down. Make sure you understand that you cannot brake, accelerate, or steer when you have loss of contact with the roadway. That's what makes hydroplaning difficult. Um, what happens... Um, with hydroplaning is that people get nervous and they turn the wheel. And when they turn the wheel, the minute they re-grab the, uh, the roadway, they're going to be shooting in that direction. And that's going to lead to some major, major problems. So how do you reduce the chance of hydroplaning? Reduce your speed in heavy rain. S stay with in your tire marks of where cars have gone before you. Look out for puddles, anything that's water. You want to go around it. Get new tires when you think they're getting worn. And by the way, the driver's ed car has all four new tires within the last three weeks. And it has an alignment. And the tires are properly inflated. So raining tomorrow or, sun or Saturday will not be a problem for my drivers. Try to keep your car going centered in the road. Remember, straight ahead does not mean linear. It means being in your lane. So keep your car in your lane centered where the cars in front of you have gone. If you feel like you're going too fast, ease off the accelerator. Don't use the brake. 
Never use the brake to slow down if you think you're going to lose contact with the road. It's going to make things worse. When you do think you have tires gripping the road, then braking is advised. But don't brake until you think you're gripping the road because if you brake too soon, too hard, or out of fear, you're going to make the car go into a worse skid. Okay, night driving. A uh, lot of uh, questions on the final from what we've got tonight. So this is going to be a question. More people are dying at night than during the day. Okay, so fatal crash rate is three times greater at night than during the day. The three categories of people that I want you to, to write down and be familiar with is that older people, because of their vision and reflexes, People on alcohol and drugs and young people, your age group. Those are the three categories of people. It's not people in their 30s, 40s, or 50s, or probably 60s. It's probably people in their 70s and 80s, your alcoholics and drug addicts, and young people between 16 and 24. Let's deal with each group. We already said that the older people can't see the road that well. Their reflexes are bad. We already know about alcoholics and drug addicts is that um, their reflexes are going to be really off. And people your age, it's speed. It's distraction. It's not bad vision. It's not bad reflexes. It's not being under the influence of anything. It's you're driving too fast and you're not paying attention to what you're doing. So that's the three categories. So what happens at night? Night vision cuts down on what you can see or see well. Remember we talked about clarity with your eyes? Very important to be able to see really, really well. Uh, know the term overdriving your headlights. That is where you can't stop within what your lights illuminate. So if your lights are shining for 150 feet, you better hope you have 150 feet to stop the vehicle because if you need 170, there are, there's 20 feet that's not accounted for. So only go as fast as you know that you can react to what your lights are illuminating. You can write this down in your notes. When do you think roadkill happens? During the day or during night? When do you think roadkill happens? Do animals get hit more at nighttime or during the day? Nighttime. They wander out into the roadway right at the beginning of where your lights are illuminating the roadway. The lights make them freeze for a moment. You react to seeing them in the road by hitting the brakes or swerving, but then they get kind of scattered, not knowing where to go because you're now moving the vehicle right or left, and then they get hit. Usually during the day, there's not that bright light that freezes them for a moment and you get to see them coming out of the bushes off to the side. Your peripheral vision is much better during the day than it is at nighttime. You're more apt to hit an animal at night than you are during the day. So just remember that. I'll show you a, a clip on animals probably the last week of class. I do want you to write this down. High beams usually go about a football field, about 350 feet, and low beams shine about 100, 150 feet. I don't know about you, but some of these uh, blue lights, you know, the halogen lights coming at you, they're kind of annoying. I'm not a big fan of them. I will test you on this last bullet. The Lost State's headlights must be on one half hour after sunset to one half hour before sunrise or any time where your vision is, is limited. I will guarantee you, I will guarantee you that some of you are going to get that question wrong on the final. See, I took it off the, the slide right now. Most of you will probably even forgot what I just, what I just read. A half hour after sunset. So remember, once the sun sets below the horizon, it's still light out. So you have a half hour now before legally you have to have your headlights on. And if you've ever stayed up all night long, you know before the sun comes up over the, the horizon, over the tree line, it gets bright. You don't see the sun yet, but it's getting brighter. So it goes from nighttime to daytime. Don't get dusk and dawn. It won't be on the test. 
It's a half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise. Got to know that. Got to know that for, for, for my final. Oh, the last thing, because um, I, I want to save uh, fatigue driving because that's going to take about 15, 20 minutes. It's going to get us out. But I forgot to pull this out when I was talking about driving in the winter. Does anybody know what this is? Okay. Does anybody know what this is? So I'm going to wait for a moment. I'm going to see if someone can guess. Someone guess what this is. And while you're guessing, uh, for those of you that didn't do chapter 13, make sure that you have that completed uh, for Monday. Uh, Monday's class, we're going to get into alcohol and drugs. We're going to talk about the behavior of people that are getting behind the wheel of a car under the influence. Uh, but we're going to finish up on fatigue and uh, people that are, are too tired to drive. We didn't really get a chance to get into that tonight, and I don't want to use up the last. I will put a worksheet. So write this down. I will put a worksheet in the Facebook page that I want you to do what we've covered tonight because we went through so much stuff, driving in the snow, sleet, uh, ice, fog. Um, it locks your tire. Um you're, you're pretty close, Anthony. You're really super close. Um, it does look a tire lock, but it, it's, it's called a traction mat. Let me put in the um, comments here in, um, in YouTube. I'll put what it is. That is basically to when you get stuck in the snow. Let me show you. When you get stuck in the snow, you stick it underneath your tire and, and your, your, tire goes, your tire goes on the top of this and it rolls. It rolls right on this metal trap. But this does look like a boot. If you were to get a parking ticket, this kind of looks like one of those, those um, things that they put on your car. So that's what it is. So the homework is just the worksheet and the uh, chapter 13. Yeah, that's what it is. There's nothing on alcohol. Um, you go, Wait on the alcohol, uh, chapter 18. If you get it done early, that's fine. I'm not going to really look at it until, until Tuesday. Um, so remember, class next week, Monday through Thursday. Um, so chapter 18. If you want to read it early, that's fine, but you can save it for um, Monday night. And the same thing with changing the laws, that's for Tuesday night. So, but I'll be looking at 13. You have the weekend to do it. You had the midterm to study for. So that's it for tonight. Um, we'll finish this up on Monday and uh, get into, I think, some interesting topics next week with alcohol and drugs and highway driving. Uh, those are always, uh, I think, good classes. I'd rather have you in class to talk about it, but um, it is an interesting class. So, See you on Monday, 8 o'clock. Have a good weekend.